Bob McDonald is a recently retired board chair, president, and chief executive officer of the Procter & Gamble Company. P&G is one of the 15 most valuable companies in the world. Under his leadership as CEO, P&G saw annual sales of more than $84 billion and its stock price increased by 60%. In 2007, McDonald received the inaugural Leadership Excellence Award from the U.S. Naval Academy and the Harvard Business Review. He's received three honorary doctorates and served as chair of the Board of Visitors for the Foucault School of Business at Duke University. Some of the things you may not know about Bob, he was born in Gary, Indiana, lived uh, in the steel mill town there, and his dad worked in the mills until his dad went to college. Both of his grandmothers in the early 1900s graduated from university. His mom, his dad, his brother, sister, all involved in church, in the Presbyterian church, growing up in Sunday school and youth group, and his dad was an elder in the church. He's been married to Deanne for 36 years this last summer. I think this next summer will be 37. They have two children, Jennifer and Robert, 31 and 30. Uh, Robert is an attorney. Jennifer works uh, in marketing for American Express. Uh, Bob is a West Point graduate. He has an MBA from the University of Utah. And he served P&G since uh, 1980 in the United States, Toronto, Canada, Manila, Japan, Brussels, and then became a CEO in 2009 back in Cincinnati. And his children never attended any educational product of the U.S. until they came to do their work in the United States uh, for college. But Bob, I wanted to share two other little quotes uh, from an interview we had earlier this spring. I just wanted to read these to you because um, I think it shows a little bit of the heart of uh, Bob McDonald. And these are just two excerpts from an interview that I had with Bob this last spring. He was talking about dating his wife and, and uh, part of his life with me, and he said, I saw my future wife in the kitchen helping the bride's mother prepare some dishes for an event that evening, and I knew immediately that she was the one. Absolutely. The only way to explain that is God. And this is what I think is really powerful. When you see the person you love, you see the face of God. When I look into the eyes of my children, I see the face of God. I don't think I would understand God's love for us as fully if I wasn't married or didn't have children. And the second quote. I left the military service in 1980 when my commitment was up. It was a difficult decision. If I'd stayed in the military, I wanted to be in the Airborne Ranger Unit, which meant I would be deployed constantly, and that was not the kind of life I wanted for my family. So I put priority on my marriage and having the MBA and the engineering undergraduate degree. I wrote to about 120 companies, interviewed with about 30, and knew that Procter & Gamble was for me. In my opinion, if you're going to be in business, you work for one of the greatest companies in the world. If you're going to be in marketing, you work for Procter & Gamble. So I joined the company in 1980 in marketing. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Bob McDonald, CEO of Procter & Gamble. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real thrill for me to be here with you today. Um, Rick and I have, have talked about this day for some time, and it's, it's great that it's, that it's here. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about that story of meeting my wife. Uh, I had gone to West Point, and my best friend at West Point uh, was also my roommate in the 82nd Airborne Division. We uh, rented a uh, condominium, uh, and we lived together. And he came back. Uh, from one Christmas vacation, it was Christmas of 1976, he lived in Houston, he said, I've met the girl of my dreams and I asked her to marry me. And I said, Peter, you got to be crazy. How many times did you go out with this girl? And he said, well, we had maybe six or seven dates uh, over that time period and I asked her to marry me. He said, but don't worry, our parents go to the same church, they live in the same community. And I said, well, has she said yes or no, or what's going to happen? He said, well, we're going to, um, I'm going to call her on Valentine's Day and ask her for the answer. So Linda said yes, that she would marry him. They set the date to be July 2nd, uh, 1977, when they would get married. And Peter asked me to be in the wedding. Do I need to lower this one? He also, um, 
At the same time as this was going on, Peter's wife, Linda, and they're still married today, 37 years later, um, Peter's wife, Linda, was asking my future wife to be in the wedding for, for her, to be a bridesmaid, because they were childhood friends. Well, as luck would have it, or as fate would have it, uh, I, w I was on division readiness status during the wedding and wasn't able to go. I had to go to the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division and explain this close friendship between West Point colleagues. Could I get an exception to policy and go to the wedding? And he allowed me to do that. So I arrived at the wedding on June 30th, 1977. The wedding was July 2nd. And Rick told the story about how I, uh, I went there from the Army, so I had no money. So we lived in homes in the community and we wore our uniforms for the wedding because none of us had any money to rent tuxedos or anything else. So I dropped my bags in the home and I figured I should go to the bride's house, Linda's house, and help uh, do anything I could to see if I could help with the wedding. And that was when I opened the back door and I saw Deanne, my wife, standing in the kitchen and immediately fell in love. So that was June 30th, 1977. We got engaged July 30th, 1977. And we were married December 31st, 1977. And the only reason I waited a month to get engaged was I wanted to ask her father's permission to get married, and I wanted her to meet my parents, and that took us about 30 days to arrange. And the only reason I waited till December 31st to uh, get married was that was the only time my buddies and I could get off from the Army. We were on, division, we were on readiness status for for the country, and so if you ever wanted to attack the United States, attack on New Year's Eve, uh, there'd be some people missing. But uh, I, tell that st I told that story a lot at Procter & Gamble because I didn't want any employee to ever accuse me of lacking decisiveness. <laughs> anyway, it's a happy story. I wanted to talk with you today about a topic which is, which is very, very important to me. And for those of you who were in the class that I taught this morning, I apologize for having some similarity with these remarks. But this is, this is really what, what, what I'm about and the message I'm trying to carry uh, all over the world. And that is the importance of purpose and values in leading your life. Uh, as I look around, uh, I see too many people around the world who aren't sure about the values that are the foundation of their life and who are living their life potentially without direction. So what I try to do is I try to teach young people a process for going through and, and understanding what is your purpose and actually writing that purpose down and, and making sure that you discuss it with people you love, people who can maybe affect that, and periodically updating that purpose. And at the same time, looking at your life, looking at the experiences that you had in life, how you were acculturated, uh, the different cathartic experiences you may have had, what your parents taught you, what your education is, and see if you could develop a list of beliefs that provide the foundation for your leadership and for your relationships in life. I've been doing this now about 25, 30 years, and I update it frequently. I have 10 leadership beliefs, and uh, if you're interested in, in knowing what those are, I'm going to talk about a few of them this afternoon, but if you'd like to know all 10, they're on our Procter & Gamble website. If you click through Procter & Gamble executives, and, or if you just go on Google and you, and you click Procter & Gamble, or you click uh, Bob McDonald Values-Based Leadership, uh, all 10 will come up. And I'd also like to offer to help any of you who would like to do this process yourself, because um, I try to help as many people as I can do this. My email address is mcdonald.ra. Those are my initials, Robert A. at png.com. So what I want to do is try to role model some of those important beliefs for you. I'm going to tie those beliefs back to experiences I've had because what we discover is that people don't remember the beliefs, but they remember the stories that animate the beliefs. A friend of mine, uh, Noel Tishy, who taught at the University of Michigan, I know it was a friend of Rick's, uh, wrote a book called The Leadership Engine. And what he wrote about in that book is that leadership is storytelling. As we think of ourselves as leaders or as parents, and the wonderful thing is everything we learn about leadership, we can apply to parenting and vice versa. 
Um, as, as we find ourselves parenting or in leadership positions, we tell stories about our experiences that help the individuals understand uh, our leadership. So I'm gonna tell stories. Those stories are important. They're cathartic stories that led to those beliefs. So let's, let's get started. The first uh, belief is, is frankly the most important one and one I've already referred to, which is leading a life inspired by a purpose is much more important and leads to a more meaningful life than simply meandering through life without direction. Many people meander through life without direction. And uh, I think that's a, that's a real tragedy. Uh, fast forward for me, if you would. Imagine we're all in the hospital here in Abilene, and somebody we love says to us, you know, did you accomplish your purpose in life? What would you say? Would you say, gee, I don't know, I, I never really thought about what my purpose was? Would you say, I'm working on it, but I'm not there yet? What would you say? And I think one of the risks we face today is that all of us carry these electronic devices. I certainly do. Many of us have these electronic devices that ping us when somebody wants to send us a message. And uh, these devices, computers, phones, and other things, tend to distract us from what our life's purpose may be because they tend to make us live in the here and now. And oftentimes we need to step back from the here and now and say, are we really focused on what's important? I was telling the class this morning that about every three months or so I sit down with my assistant and we go through my calendar. and We say, how much time did we spend against the real priorities versus how much time did we spend simply reacting to emails text messages or others. So if you haven't done it yet, my suggestion is uh, spend some time. Think about what your life's purpose is. Write it down. Don't be afraid to write it down. Don't, I know many people say, gee, I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm right. Well, don't worry about being right. Get started. Talk to your loved ones. It'll certainly change over time. Now I want to give you some hints that I used as I went through this process. Um, if you look at this slide, these are actually the, the pictures of the same person, all four pictures. Um, on the left, you've got Bobby. That's me. Kid grew up in Gary, Indiana. And uh, when I was young, uh, I wanted to be a Boy Scout. Uh, to me, Boy Scouts was a great organization. And what I found through my life in Boy Scouts, I really enjoyed helping other people. I was telling the group this morning that uh, uh, when, I, when I give gifts, I love giving gifts. I get so excited about the gifts I get to give, but when I get a gift, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I'm humbled by the fact that somebody would give me a gift. Now, I don't think this is accidental. I think the Lord wired us this way. He wired us to enjoy giving more than receiving. And the way this plays out for my wife is when I see something that I think she liked, I buy it for her, and then I have to hold on to it until the event. Well, I'm usually so excited about the gift that I have to give it to her before the birthday or before Christmas or before the event, which means I have to go back and buy another gift. And I usually give that before the event, and then a third and a fourth. But it, there's just something about me. I like to give gifts. The second picture is, uh, is me, and fortunately this morning we had a student of ancient history in the class that I was speaking to who recognized that that was President Gerald Ford who gave me my diploma. Uh, a man from Grand Rapids, Michigan, not too far from where Rich is from. And, uh, and uh, when he gave me my diploma, as you might be able to see, I, I sent the picture to him. I had him inscribe the bottom of the picture, and he wrote, uh, he wrote what he said to me there. He said, Bob, I can't believe you graduated, and uh, woe be it for our army. But the reason I went to West Point was I wanted to lead a different life. I wanted to lead a life where I could help the people who were living behind the Iron Curtain, there was an Iron Curtain then, and I could help the people who were living in non-free societies. And I figured the best way to do that was to be a military officer. And then the third picture is me as an airborne ranger, jungle warfare expert, Arctic warfare expert, desert warfare expert in the 82nd Airborne Division. And the reason I wanted to be in the 82nd Airborne Division, I wanted to be an infantry officer, was again this theme of I wanted to be on the front lines of freeing people who were living in non-free societies. 
And so that's what animated me throughout those years, and that's why my purpose is all about improving lives. The fourth picture is uh, me the day I joined the Procter & Gamble Company. That's June 4th, 1980. And uh, I was joking with the class this morning that you can tell by this picture we haven't figured out hair regrowth yet. <laughs> but we're working on it. So all of you who are hair challenged like me, stick with us. We'll have it figured out pretty soon. And all of us will go back to the days of when we had long hair. Um, I joined the Procter & Gamble Company because of the purpose of the company. And one of the pieces of advice I gave to the students this morning was, if you're looking to work for a company, know that company's purpose. Know that company's values. And know the people in the company who breathe life to that purpose and values every single day. The thing that attracted me to the Procter & Gamble Company was the purpose. The purpose that we work to touch and improve lives now and for generations to come. Now, you wouldn't think that Gillette razor blades improves someone's life, or that uh, Febreze improves someone's life, or that Tide improves someone's life, but we do. And these products have small but meaningful benefits that improve lives in small ways. The uh, values of the company were also important to me. Things like integrity. I mean, I grew up at West Point where we have an honor code. We don't lie, cheat, steal. We don't tolerate people who do. Um, leadership. We expect every employee to lead. Leadership is not a title. Leadership is a behavior. Uh, ownership. Every employee owns company stock, and the, uh, the interests of the employee and the company are inseparable because of that. Trust. Uh, we ask about 5 billion people on the planet use our product every day. They trust that product. They trust us. We can't lose that trust. We have to work hard to earn and keep that trust. And then, of course, passion for winning. Uh, we want to beat the competition. So this idea of improving lives has, uh, in effect, been a factor in all of the decisions I've made, including the company uh, that I wanted to join. That's why I think determining what your purpose is and looking at the organizations you're a member of will help you determine that purpose. My second uh, belief is that companies must do well and do good at the same time. Now what I mean by this is companies have to do well financially. Uh, Rick talked about the fact that uh, when I became CEO our stock price was 51 at the time I retired, it was 81. That's a 60% increase. You got to do well financially. That's important. There's no question that that's important uh, because that's the way the institution stays in business. And the Procter & Gamble Company has been around 175 years. There are only about three or four companies that are that old in this country. So it's obviously important to do well financially. But I also believe that the company has to do good at the same time. If a company wants to survive, today, a company has to do well and do good at the same time. Consumers have more power than ever before. We all carry these computers uh, with us and these smartphones. We all have available information. Uh, consumers simply aren't going to buy the products of a company that, for example, would trash the environment. So com companies have to do well and do good at the same time. And this is our real opportunity for us. Uh, it creates a positive and a virtuous cycle over time. So I want to tell you about a couple of examples at Procter & Gamble, but I could, I could spend the rest of our day today talking about more examples. The first is an example for our Always product. Always is a, is a feminine hygiene napkin that, uh, that, that women and girls wear uh, during the week of menstruation. Now you probably don't know this, but in many parts of the world, menstruation is thought to be um, a dirty uh, activity. In fact, uh, I was in Bali, Indonesia, and there was a Hindu temple, and on the temple was a sign outside the temple that said, you know, if you're a woman who's menstruating, you're not allowed in the temple. Another example is in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Kenya, Nigeria. Uh, girls don't have the proper products. Society doesn't understand menstruation. As a result, girls don't go to school the week of menstruation. Well, you can imagine if a girl doesn't attend school one week out of every month, it's only three or four months before they drop out of school. That's a tragedy. That's a travesty. 
because basically the country is losing half of their population in being educated. So what we do is we go in, we work with the government, we work with society, we actually teach in the schools about menstruation, we provide the products, and we help girls stay in school. Please watch. Good morning, school. Good morning. I live at Ngong Town. I'm 13 years old. I go to school at Ngong Township Primary School. Some of the games that I play at school are football, volleyball, netball, and handball. My name is Snellius. I'm 13 years old. I go to school to get education so that I'll be a good person in the society. I got to know about Always when my sister introduced it to me. She told me it's called Always Ultra. They are pads which keep you very dry and comfortable, even if you're in class. Always help me because it makes me feel better. I just come to school as usual, and you cannot even notice. Some of the things that are most important in my life are my education and my family. I feel very comfortable when I'm using always. It's very important in my life because if I don't have them, I would have been missing school and I would go down academically. When I use always, I usually come to school and I usually feel better while even playing with my friends there and I don't feel embarrassment. So I think you can see from this example that there's a, a dotted line, a very fine line between philanthropy and business. And, you know, are we, by going into schools, teaching about menstruation, giving the pads away, are we doing philanthropy or are we doing good business? And I would argue it's both. Because the more girls we can have educated, the greater the society, the greater the economy, the more people able to buy our products and keeping girls in school that want to be in school is simply the right thing to do. Another example is our Children's Safe Drinking Water Program. We invented a technology called the P&G Purifier of Water. It's some chemistry that you can use, put it in 10 liters of water, it'll clean that water up, kill the bacteria and viruses, make that water safe to drink in about 20 minutes. This uh, about 2,000 children die a day from drinking unsafe water. 2,000 children a day. That doesn't have to happen. Water is a woman's issue, is a female issue. What do I mean by that? The average woman in the world walks seven kilometers a day to get clean water for her family. After she gets the water, she then boils it to make it clean. Again, that doesn't have to happen. One of the greatest things we can do is provide clean water to free those mothers up, to free those homemakers up, to stay at home with their children. So we've worked with over 100 aid agencies around the world in order to provide these packets, in order to clean up water. I've been in many places where upstream you'll have uh, defecation and garbage in the water, downstream you'll have a little boy with a bucket getting water from a pipe not even understanding that the viruses and bacteria in that water will kill them. 2,000 children die a day. It doesn't have to happen. So in our program, what we've done is we've uh, we built a factory to, uh, to provide these packets. Um, we work with 108 agencies around the world. And a couple of years ago, at the Clinton Global Initiative, when President Clinton brings together non-government organizations, businesses, governments, to try to work together against common problems, I committed that our company would save one life every hour by providing clean water by the year 2020. Right now, we're at about six billion liters of, uh, of clean water. We built a new factory in Singapore to make more of these packets. We're working with more aid agencies to get deeper penetration around the world. President Clinton came to our, um, our reception at this event and he talked about Procter & Gamble. I was off to the side, 
uh, and he asked me what commitment I had made that morning, and the commitment was to save one life every hour. Please watch. Of all the companies I work with, hardly anybody has any bigger dreams than P&G. What did you say at our meeting? You're going to save a life an hour from now on? One life every hour. Yeah, from now on. That's a pretty nice dream for one corporation in a big world that's highly competitive. Just think, even for your size, if every business incorporated in every developed country prorated that commitment, down to people with 20 employees that had a fraction of your income. Everybody prorated that commitment. God only knows how many people would be saved. So that's why I honor P&G. Big dreams, song in your heart, reality-based strategy, keep score, doesn't work, we'll do something else. If we can learn to live that way, we can get beyond our political and other divisions, and there's not a thing wrong with the country or the world that we can't make better. So again, the question is, uh, is this philanthropy or is this good business? And I would argue it's both. So companies have to do well financially, and I think they should do good at the same time. My third belief uh, is one that's very dear to my heart, and it's this idea that character is the most important trait of a leader. Uh, at West Point, or in the military, you learn that character is putting the needs of the organization above your own needs. Uh, as a West Point cadet, I learned uh, early on that I would always eat after all of my soldiers had eaten. As an officer in the Army, you always allow your soldiers to eat first. The officer eats last. It's not that you're going to run out of food. We never ran out of food, and I'm sure the Air Force doesn't run out of food. But it's a symbolic nature of the idea that your soldiers' lives are more important than your own. And what a great way to demonstrate that. And if you think about it, who would you rather serve with in combat? Somebody who put their life above your life or somebody who put their life above yours? Uh, Jim Collins talks about this in his book. Jim is a friend of mine. Uh, he wrote the book Good to Great, Built to Last. He talks about this in Good to Great. He said he calls it level five leadership. He said the best leaders are level five leaders. They're leaders whose ambition is all for the organization and not for themselves. And the question again is, which kind of leader would you rather work for? One whose ambition is for you and the organization or one whose ambition is for, your, is for themselves? A second aspect of character that I think is important is uh, the idea of taking personal responsibility. In a learning organization, the only way a learning organization can learn is if you don't repeat the same mistakes. And the only way you can not repeat the same mistakes is if when you make a mistake, you admit it, you do what we call an after-action report, and you share it so everybody learns from that mistake. Well, I learned the importance of this taking responsibility my first day at West Point. Uh, when you go to West Point, you, uh, you start as a new cadet. You're not even allowed to be called a cadet. And uh, you start in the summer, and you go through like a military basic training. It's called Beast Barracks. And that first day, you get measured for uniforms, you learn how to march, and you learn something very important, that as a plebe to anything that happens, you only have four acceptable answers. Only four answers. So anything that happens, only four acceptable answers. So imagine uh, I'm walking out to a formation that first day, and uh, Rick steps in a muck puddle and gets mud all over my shoes and my trousers, and an upperclassman comes by and stops me, embraces me, and has me stand attention and says, McDonald, you, you toolbox, didn't you polish your shoes? Didn't you take care of your trousers? Why do you have mud all over your shoes and trousers? Didn't you prepare? So I worked through my four answers to find out which one's acceptable, right? So I, my first answer I could uh, say was, yes, sir. Well, yes, sir really doesn't advance the the discussion at all, and he's just going to berate me some more, so that's probably not the right answer. So I went to my second answer, which was no, sir. That was an acceptable answer, but if I said no, sir, I would get thrown out of West Point on an honor violation, and I, I didn't want that to happen, so that was probably not the right answer. So I went to the third answer, and I used the third answer a lot. In fact, my first three months at West Point, I used the third answer to anything that happened to me. 
And that was, sir, uh, no excuse, sir. No excuse, I'm sorry, that's not their answer. It was, uh, the third answer was, sir, I do not understand. Sir, I do not understand. <laughs> so, anything bad that happened to me for those first three months, I would always say, sir, I do not understand. And they sent me to the hospital for an audiology test <laughs> to see if I was really hard of hearing. You know those things where you press down when you hear the sound? And I already gave away the answer. The right answer was that fourth answer. That, 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 that fourth answer was, no excuse, sir. That is a very powerful collection of words. Now, obviously, implicit in that collection of words is no excuse and it won't happen again. But this idea of taking responsibility, of saying no excuse, is a powerful idea. As Rick said, I have a daughter and a son, and I taught them much of what I'm talking to you about today at a very young age. So my wife and I, Deanne and I, are living in Cincinnati. We have a two-story house. On the weekend, my daughter runs out of the house to play with friends. Her name's Jennifer. Deanne and I go upstairs to her room. We discover she hadn't picked up her room. Bed was not made properly. We thought, this is a great teaching opportunity. Of course, in those days, there was no internet. This is like 1985, no internet. We had bought every baby book ever published. I mean, I'm sure all of you who are parents know this feeling. When that first baby comes, you are sure it's Humpty Dumpty, you're gonna drop it and it's gonna break. And you're, you're, you're anxious to parent the right way, because I don't know about you, but no user's manual came out. I mean, you've got the Bible, but no user's manual came out, you know? So we had every baby book. We went to the bookshelf. We took off all these books, and I took out my yellow legal pad, you know, and I started making notes about the lessons I was going to teach Jennifer. I was on about the third or fourth page, and she comes into the house, runs up to her room, and Deanne and I, of course, run up after her, and I've got my legal pad with me, ready to go. We get to her room, and you can, you can kind of visualize uh, Deanne and me standing in the door and the light kind of coming down off of us on the little Jennifer there. Jennifer looks up, says, Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad, no excuse. I, I don't have any excuse. Don't, you know, no excuse. And I, I said, but uh, Jennifer, I, I've got this three-page lesson plan <laughs> I want to share with you. And, of course, there was no need to do that. She took responsibility, and she said it wasn't going to happen again, and it, and it hasn't. But you see what, how, it, how that idea of taking responsibility neuters any kind of activity afterwards. It's a terribly powerful concept, and unfortunately one that in our society may not be as popular uh, as it once was. So character being the most important trait of a leader, uh, putting the needs of the organization above yourself, and taking responsibility, making sure that the organization learns from mistakes or celebrates things that go right so it can be a learning organization. When I think about this idea of character, there's a collection of words from the West Point Cadet Prayer. Uh, Rick talked about my activity at West Point. I was a lesson reader, an acolyte, and chapel there, and it was an important part of my, my time. That's a picture of the West Point Cadet Chapel, which sits up on top of a hill. And uh, it was this idea of, of God, help me to choose the harder right rather than the easier wrong. Um, very powerful collection of words. Uh, I've taught this in every chance I get because I tell people if you're doing something and it feels too easy, get skeptical. Get skeptical that you might be doing the wrong thing. If you're doing something and it feels hard to do, that may be the right thing to do. It may be an indication. I told the story about when I joined the Procter & Gamble company in 1980. Um, I was a, a new hire coming out of the military, as you know, and uh, we had just introduced a new product uh, called Rely. It was a feminine hygiene product, a, a tampon, and at that time there were many women in this country suffering from a terrible disease called toxic shock syndrome, TSS for short. And uh, uh, our, our, at the time, there was some um, anxiety that our product may have been linked to this disease. So our CEO at the time, Ed Harness, who was a wonderful man, um, called in the scientists, our R&D organization. And of course, the R&Ders, the PhDs who work in R&D organizations said, you know, we need to get all the data and prove 
that everybody who had toxic shock syndrome didn't use our product. So they assembled all this data, they went into Ed's office, they presented it, and Ed said, you're proving the wrong thing. You're proving that every woman with toxic shock syndrome didn't use our product. What I'm asking you to prove is that no woman with toxic shock syndrome used our product. And of course, they couldn't prove that. So he made the courageous decision to withdraw the product from the marketplace. We just introduced it for $250 million. He withdrew it, took a $75 million after-tax write-off, which in 19, was still an enormous sum of money, but was in 1980 was an even more enormous sum of money. Our stock price fell in half, and we were afraid, you have to remember the 1980s, that we were going to be bought by a Japanese company. Um, but that was the courageous decision. That was the harder right rather than the easier wrong. And I think if you've been a company that's been around 175 years, like the Procter & Gamble company, you've always got to do the harder right rather than the easier wrong. Because that trust you have, that trust with you have, that you have with consumers all over the world, those 5 billion people who use our products, is enormous. And we can't ever forget that trust or give it up. We have to earn it every single day. So that completes the first three of my beliefs. There are seven others. I don't have time uh, this afternoon to cover them all. They are all on our website, uh, png.com, or if you simply Google my name and values-based leadership. And I hope that uh, you all want to help figure out what your purpose is, and I'd be happy to help you. Thank you. A couple of ways to, uh, to shoot some questions to Bob. Uh, you can text me at uh, that number that's shown on the screen, or we can just uh, we can go directly from the floor. So Bob's agreed to answer some questions for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So let's, uh, let's start from the floor. MC's got a microphone. If you don't mind, uh, please start with your first name, and I'm Bob. Sure. Oh, my first name's Inling. I'm originally from China. Inling? And right now in grad school. Thank you. Ni hao. Ni hao ma. How are you today? Ni hao ma. Good. Great. It's such a privilege to have you speak in our campus. And um, I, I believe you know that is PNG ranked the best employee for new grads in China like five years in a row. I, I, and, I love China. I, oh, uh, I do too. Thank you. <laughs> we, are the largest, we are the largest consumer goods company in China. We do about $5 billion a year yeah. uh, in China. Uh, but one of the things I'm most proud of is we've built over 200 Hope schools in rural areas of China. We do appreciate that. That's such such a great great blessing. Um, my question here is: so I'm always like as a, a student, grass, or on this side. So for your side, what do you think is the key point that attracted the Chinese new grass? I would say like new adult, a uh, new grass, like young adults, the most. For them, like as PNG in yeah. China, like it's what's a great the... question. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, just for background, I spent ten years of my career in Asia. A lot of those years helping to build the Chinese business. Um, until I retired, I was the chairman of the U.S.-China Business Council. Uh, so I have quite a bit of experience in China, and I've spoken to many, many people who joined our company there. The thing that I found is, and it's, it's not surprising, it works in any culture, is students want to make a difference in this world. Uh, no matter where I go in the world, no matter where I go, first thing I do is I go into homes and I watch people use our products. Because I, I want to see if there's tension in their lives that I can help solve by bringing technology. But I always end the interview, no matter the language, no matter a mud hut in Africa, an apartment in China, wherever, I always end it by what is your hopes, what are your hopes and what are your dreams? And 99.9% .9 of the time, that person will say to me that I want a better life for my children and for succeeding generations. So having done this now in about 150 countries around the world, I say to myself, why do we have a problem getting along? We all have the same dream. I don't understand that. But when I talk to these Chinese students, they want to make a difference. They want to help achieve that dream. And they know that by working for the Procter & Gamble company, 
they can help improve lives in China, whether it's going out and helping us build these Hope Schools, whether it's our roving vans with, uh, uh, with dentists on board that go into rural areas. It's the only time some of these uh, villagers will see a dentist uh, in their life, whether it's providing the feminine hygiene products I talked about or even the beauty care products. Um, in a way, our company is a way that those students can have a life of meaning and can make a difference, and I think that's one of the things that's important. Um, I, just, I just came back from my alma mater, West Point, uh, last weekend. My wife and I have endowed a leadership conference there. We use the Behavioral Science and Leadership Department at West Point um, to help, help us do that, and I invite business mentors in from all over the world. One person I invited in was Mr. G of Beijing Huayan, the chairman of Beijing Huayan. I don't know if you're familiar with Beijing Huayan. And he helped me mentor the group of students I was with. We had 90 students from around the world, including Beijing University, Tokyo University. And all of these students said the same thing. They said, we want a better life for our families and for our future generations. And so what I was trying to demonstrate to them is while we all have differences and while we're diverse and we're all different, we have a common hope. And if we can work against that common hope, all other differences go away. We make life better for everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to tell you that. Thank you. Another question? Shishi. Shishi. How are you? Thank you for coming to Abilene. Uh, you spoke a lot about Procter & Gamble, which is a monster, monster business. Uh, a lot of us here are in the small business world and entrepreneur world. Um, loved hearing about your value system, but uh, can you give anything additional to those in small business and those that are entrepreneurs that you might want to add on that you would tell us versus a Fortune 100 business? Thank you. I don't mean to sound trite about this answer, but I do think, I do think there's um, consistency, whether it's a small business or big business. The Procter & Gamble company really operates like a collection of 300 brands. Every one of our brands is like its own company, and the corporation itself is like an investment banker. I think the advantage that um, a small business has, if I can say it that way, is the intimacy that you have with the group. So one of the things I would try to do as a CEO of a very large company is create small group activities so that intimacy can exist. Again, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm about is, is making sure people know each other, get to know each other, care about each other, put diverse groups of people together because diverse groups of people are more innovative than homogeneous people. But I think that's a competitive advantage small business has. Another competitive advantage small business has is the ability to move more quickly. You know, if, if we want to make a change to uh, the Tide brand, which is a, uh, what, probably about a $300 million business in the, just in this country, it's going to take a long time to make that change in all the factories, and the small business can move much more quickly. So I would, you know, as, as small businesses compete with big businesses, I would think about uh, getting close to the consumer, closer than a big business might be able to, uh, moving fast and with flexibility, and creating that intimate work environment that I think all of us crave. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I do think it's. Bob, a question uh, several people have texted in and, and asked about the work-life balance question. How do, how do you do that in your own life, and how do you encourage those uh, who are under your leadership to, to find that? Yeah, I think um, work-life balance uh, is, is a big issue. I don't mean to suggest it's not. But one of the things I have found uh, throughout my career is all of these jobs, and I'm sure any of your jobs, are too big to overwork. You can't, you can't overwork your job. You can't work so hard that you ever overcome your job. And oftentimes, by trying to work too hard, you become overly myopic uh, in your work, and everything looks like the biggest problem that ever existed. And what I found is that the, maybe the best people in our company were those who uh, did things outside the office, got different experiences, spent time with their families, uh, spent time in their, in their churches, because they maintained that perspective on what we were trying to do at work. We actually, I don't know if you saw it in our purpose, but we actually encourage uh, employees 
to do service activities uh, in the community. And we believe that's important because if, if your purpose as an individual is to improve lives or serve others, you can't compartmentalize that. It's not like, well, I'll go to work and I'll do that, but then when I go home, I won't. So we would actually provide opportunities for employees to work in the community, whether it's United Way um, or in, in other ways, because we felt that that generated a, a better rounded individual who then became more innovative. So um, even though I uh, was able to become CEO of our company, uh, I was a scout master of my son's troop. He's an Eagle Scout. Uh, I was active in my church. I was the moderator of our church council in Japan. Uh, my wife and I were active in Girl Scouting, Little League. So I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's almost counterintuitive. You, you can't outwork these jobs, is my point of view. I've got another one here, if nobody's got one. Uh, question here coming in. What role did mentors play in your own life, in your own professional, spiritual development? Can you speak to that, please? Oh, that's a big question. Um, the, the easy and impor important answer is mentors play an incredibly important life, uh, play an incredibly important role in life. In business, um, my first general manager, uh, the day I interviewed, um, uh, well, I'll tell you a story. The day I interviewed at Procter & Gamble, it was April 4th, 19... 80, um, I went through the series of interviews and they offered me a job on the spot. And I was surprised because of the companies I had interviewed with, nobody offered me a job on the spot. So I was worried that they were testing my decisiveness. So um, knowing that I wanted to demonstrate my decisiveness, I called my wife, uh, who was in North Carolina at the time, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where the 82nd Airborne is, and I said, you know, they offered me a job on the spot. She said, well, what do you think? We discussed it, and I decided I would accept on the spot. So I accepted on the spot, and I only found out later that very few people do that. They almost had a heart attack. But then they had to figure out what to do with me the rest of the day, because normally the second part of the day is meant to, if you've been given an offer, is meant to persuade you to take it. And so I was, <laughs> I was taken around to meet my new bosses, and one of the people I met was my first general manager. His name was John Pepper. And uh, John was running about half of the Procter & Gamble company at that time. It was about a $10 billion company. Today we're about $85 billion. And um, I, I remember there was a long line of people. And as I went in, John's assistant said, now you're only going to have three or four minutes because he's very, very busy. And I said, yes, ma'am, I understand. Everybody to me was ma'am and sir uh, then. And so I went in, I sat down, and I, and I, I you know, listened to John talk about Procter & Gamble. And uh, I was getting very nervous because one minute went to two, to three, to four, to five. He started asking me about the symphony in, in Cincinnati, the opera, the baseball team, the football team, Procter & Gamble, my family, mortgages, homes. And five minutes became 10, 10 became 15. And I'm sweating bullets thinking, you know, I'm in the Army. I know what orders are, and I'm ordered to get out of here. And so I, I kept getting up, and he kept pushing me down. I kept getting up, he pushed me down. And I was sitting there thinking, you know what? You are so lucky. God has looked out for you because if this person who runs half this company can spend this much time with you and you just were hired, you haven't contributed anything yet, imagine what kind of company this is. And uh, John has been a very important mentor and friend to me for 40 years, uh, well, 35 years. And, um, and I'll never forget that day. And I've always tried to treat every employee I'm able to come in contact with the way John treated me that day. So mentoring is incredibly important. In terms of my um, spiritual life, uh, the Army chaplains, that um, every battalion in the, in the Army has a chaplain. The Army chaplains were always spiritual mentors to me. They always helped me with my Bible study. Um, there was one pastor I had in Japan that I'm particularly close to. Uh, his name's Gerard Marx. He ran the Baptist Church in New Zealand, and he actually was a pastor for us in Japan. And uh, together we brought in a Japanese pastor and were able to uh, evangelize to uh, Japanese people, bring them to Christ, get them to join the church. And my pastor now, uh, Chad Hovind, um, who's a, a wonderful, wonderful pastor, I consider to be a, a mentor. Um, Thank you. I don't think you, you know, I think the, it's interesting. It's again a, it's a, again a paradox. 
Uh, most of the important things in life are a paradox. The paradox is, as a leader, you're by yourself. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. As a leader, you, you are lifted up by the people around you. Thank you. I've, I've got a bunch here. Knowing me from the last 12 hours, you know, you know I was going to ask you this question. But there did, a question did come in about this, okay. about a difficulty that you faced. Um, it was coined in leadership, but I'm thinking about the question I've yeah. asked you several times. And how did you face it, and how did you overcome it? Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but uh, when, I was, when I was young, um, uh, I almost uh, drowned. My, my family uh, lived not far from Lake Michigan in Gary, Indiana, and we went, and my brother and I, who was 18 months older than I was, would roughhouse in the water, and he held me under a little bit too long. He thinks it wasn't long enough, but he held me under <laughs> a little bit too long, and, uh, and I almost drowned. And from that day on, I have always had a fear of water. I still do not like water. Um, and uh, that's why I went to West Point instead of the Naval Academy. And uh, <laughs> I just don't like water. And, um, but, I, but, but in my family, we had a tradition of scouting. My, my father was our scoutmaster. My mother was our den mother. And I desperately wanted to become an Eagle Scout. And um, I was unable to do that because in those days, you had to get swimming merit badge and life-saving merit badge. And despite my parents, um, good efforts to take me to swimming pools and get me the instruction I needed, which I could, I could do the instruction. Uh, I was just scared of water. And uh, I would literally, imagine this, I played football on a um, undefeated uh, high school football team in Chicago. We were ranked second in the state. I was an all-conference football player. And I would run out of this pool crying because I couldn't swim. Um, it wasn't a very comfortable picture. And uh, so I never did get swimming and life-saving, and I used the excuse of my other athletics uh, to, to basically drop out of Boy Scouts, missing those two merit badges. Well, the problem I discovered, uh, of course, I applied to first go to West Point when I was in sixth grade. My congressman at the time was Don Rumsfeld. And um, I discovered, as I was reading through the material, of course, that West Point had a swimming requirement. You have to be able to swim. I think it's 600 meters, you have to be able to do four different strokes and do a bunch of other things just to get into the academy. And then your first year, you take uh, basically uh, half a year of survival swimming. You learn strokes, you swim long distances, you jump off of a 10 meter tower to simulate jumping off the side of a boat, you take your trousers off, you inflate them, you do all of these things. And um, I, I was really worried about it, but I, I prayed about it and uh, I asked for help. And, um, and I was focused on that goal of going to West Point and graduating from West Point enough that I was over, able to overcome my fear. So um, whenever somebody tells me about an obstacle they have in their life, I always think about set a bigger goal. You know, set a goal that will make you overcome that fear and, and pray for some help. And um, I was able to do that. Well, when we finished the swimming course at West Point, I asked my instructor, who was very nice about it, I said, would you please write a letter to the Boy Scouts and tell them that I completed the requirements for uh, life-saving merit badge and swimming merit badge, and he did that. Unfortunately, I got a letter back from the Boy Scouts reminding me that uh, if you're 18 or older, you're not allowed to be a Boy Scout. So. <laughs> I have the letter, but it's somewhat of a Pyrrhic victory. Can we thank Bob McDonald for coming and being with thank us Thank you. Today? Thank you.